You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Um, well, in, initially, uh, it's, a, it's a family involvement. I mean, my father was a, a sound editor in England. Um, he's now retired. Um, so editing has been something that I grew up with, um, going to work with my dad. I've even got pictures of me back in you know, the late 1970s with, with single, single stripe and film in my hands. So it was really my father that got me involved. But I also did go to a, a film school in England, um, a very small, re- relatively unknown one, but uh, it, was, it was still a, a film course that I did in England. But it, and essentially it was a family connection. So, uh, so you were basically born into it. So it was almost like it was in your blood to, to, to get into the uh, film industry. In lots of ways, yeah. I mean, it really was. It was something that, that we grew up with um, on a on a you know really a day to day basis. So l- let me ask you this: Is, is there a difference or, or of, of of any kind, whether major or, or minor, between the the sort of the English film uh, industry and the American film industry? Um, if there is, I'm not sure. Um, that I'm really aware of it. When I was in England, I worked on lots of American films anyway, or at least, with, you know, what they were financed from the United States. Um, so I couldn't really tell the difference. I mean, there's, there's um, certainly larger budgets in the United States, and I, and I did work on some English films that were of smaller budgets. But no, as far as, the, as, far as my work experience is concerned, there, there wasn't really a difference. Or isn't really a difference. So, so when did you first, you know, decide? I mean, when you were editing, actually, let me ask you this: when you were when you're going back into editing, and you were actually, you know, uh, as as you were sort of born into this, did did you have like a movie Ola at home or anything else where you were just sort of cutting your own films together, or maybe even a Super 8 camera? Well, um, no, we didn't have a movie Ola. They, they, they were quite uh, big, big machines. Um, but I did get used to using a movie Ola from the age of about. I would say 10 years old um, is that my father would bring us into work and uh, and I would get to use the machinery and that and and steam backs and flatbed chems. Um, but we didn't have any equipment at home. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, Michael, when did you make the trip then from from England to over here to America? Uh, in 1994. So w- then when you came over, did you already have like a few gigs lined up and like movies to edit? No, no, not at all. I, I was on a movie uh, that started in England, and it was a, it was a picture called We're Back, A Dinosaur's Story. Um, and I, I was a sound assistant on that movie, uh, and we were mixing at Twickenham Studios in England. And uh, the uh, executive producer on the movie was Steven Spielberg. And he uh, saw the mix from Twickenham and wanted some changes and decided that it would be better to bring – the movie from England to the United States uh, to do the final mix at Universal. Actually, we ended up at Todd Ayo, but um, actually it's the other way around. We ended up at Universal. Uh, that's how I initially came here. Um, uh, it, yeah, that was all in, that was in 1993. And then I m- met a girl, in fact, um, on that movie and then went back to England um, in the meantime, we did the long distance relationship thing. And then I moved here completely in um, September of 94. But at that time, I had no um, gigs lined up. When I arrived here, uh, I really cold called British editors that I'd known in England, um, about five of them. And uh, luckily for me, one of them came back actually with a job offer. So finding work was initially was was as a relatively easy for me um just because this this particular editor picked me up and uh, gave me a job so at, at that point he he knew you so you didn't have to like show him a like a reel or anything right so he actually knew you from before yeah i knew i knew him from england and he was a british editor that would worked in england and then was working here he was working on a picture picture called rob roy uh for michael Caton jones the editor was uh peter honess and uh, as i say i knew him from england and he was one of the people I called, and he just happened to have an opening at that particular time. So, uh, 
j- just to sort of follow up on that question and, and just to sort of, you know, if you're ever going, because I actually have some friends of mine who've actually gone from country to country. I think that's a, a really incredible feat because if you go to a, a, another, even if you're in England, let's say, and you go from maybe Manchester to London, you know, you, you, you're, you're depending upon the size of the network, you might have, you know, no nobody, you know, have to actually get your foot in the door through reels. Uh, you know, you're basically starting over from scratch, you know, and then going from a different uh, a country to another country, I mean, you really either have to, A, have a deep network, or you have to be able to just sort of, you know, get your foot in the door at a lot of places. Um, and I actually know a couple of people, Michael, who are actually moving from, like, different places like Australia uh, to uh, England because they want to actually get into the, into the British film industry. So it's just kind of, I always kind of find it, you know, fascinating because just to be able to do that, you either have to do one of, the, one of those two things, have a deep network or be able to just knock on 10,000 doors to get one yes. Yeah, well, that that's right. I mean, you know, when I look back on it, it was a crazy thing to do. But I, I was young at the time and uh, it... it uh, it didn't feel scary at the time. It was just something I wanted to do. Um, and for some reason, I felt that it would work out. And uh, to, to one extent or another, it has. Uh, so I feel very lucky. <laughs> you know, don't you, and I'll, I'll, you touched on something too. Don't you feel when you're younger, maybe, you know, uh, when you're first starting out in film, anything's possible? You know, like anything, you know what I mean? Like you could, it, it just feels that. It, uh, Everything's just going to come together. Where you're in a project or what have you, you just go. You know what? I, I don't. You know, damn the uh, the people who naysayers. And, and I don't have a lot of budget. I don't have a lot of budget. I don't have a lot of you know whatever. But we're just going to go do something. You know what I mean? Because uh, I mean, I, honestly, like I, I'm 32 right now, and when I was uh, first starting out, I would actually go out and shoot a hell of a lot more than I do now. You know what? Right. I mean, has, has a similar effect happened to you? Um, I think that. Uh... It was definitely my experience was um, uh, I I didn't really consider the possibility of failing. And that wasn't any kind of not meant in an arrogant way. It's just that I, I, I just felt that it would work out. It was something that I really wanted to do to move to the United States and work in, in film editing. And it was just something that I felt would work out. Um, and I wasn't I wasn't scared about it um as i say probably foolishly looking back but i felt it was it was just something that would would just happen um there's definitely a sort of a a, a fatalist element to it um i I guess i just didn't consider what would happen if i failed (laughs) (laughs) yeah you 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 take quitting and failing off the table right and basically you're like you, you don't give yourself a choice you just say say to yourself, "Listen, this is the you know I have one option, and this is it. I have to do go do this. This is what we're doing. That's that's basically was this is what I'm doing. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, and, there, and there was no considering anything else. So it was just. Um, I mean, there's been periods of unemployment in in the interim um, where things have not you know always been easy, but uh, initially it the somebody was looking after me for sure, and and it, and it was Peter Honess. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> So, so after that one editing job that we were just discussing, after that was over, you know, what what did you do to go out and, and to try to find like more assignments and more movies? Um, after after Rob Roy, yes, mm-hmm. yeah, um, I uh, was actually Peter Honess had another movie um, which we went straight on to, so I didn't have to do any knocking on doors. Um, we went straight, almost straight on to a movie called uh, Eye for an Eye. Uh, that John Schlesinger directed. Um, and again, he picked me up as an assistant editor on that movie. So we all moved on as a crew. Uh, it wasn't immediate, but it was within a, within a, a, a month or two. Um, so we all moved on as a crew. So, and then, uh, then basically did you keep like moving along with Peter as you, as you, from project to project? We did, we did uh, Rob Roy, I for an eye. Uh, then we did, um, I think then the the next one we did was LA Confidential uh, in uh, in 1996. Um, so those were actually those three movies that I, I moved along with Peter. Uh, he hired me on three three movies, um, and then I, I went elsewhere after that. So uh, after you went, you know, I, I actually am looking at your IMDb right now, and uh, I have to ask, you know, you were the assistant editor on Saving Private Ryan. Uh, you know, getting to work with Spielberg and, and seeing some of you know of, of the footage they first shot and everything like that. You know, w- 
what was it like to actually work on Saving Private Ryan? Oh, well, that was it was um, an incredible experience um, from lots of points of view. First of all, we knew I'd read the script. So I knew it was going to be an amazing script, uh, an amazing movie. Um, but from a personal point of view, it was an amazing experience. We went from uh, I'd worked on Amistad before that. Um, and we went straight into Saving Private Ryan. Uh, but from a, a, say, a personal experience point of view, we went from here to Ireland, took all the equipment with us, and we were editing in a field in Ireland. And then that was for the first three weeks of the uh, for the shooting the opening sequence on the beaches. And then after three weeks, we moved to Hatfield in England um, to a facility there, uh, which was an old aerospace museum. Um, and the set was built on the uh, on the airfield. Um, so, I mean, everything about that movie was amazing, um, uh, at, at the time and we knew it at the time that we were very excited to work, work on the show. Did you ever get to actually meet Steven, uh, at any point? Uh, yeah, many times. I mean, he would come to editing, uh, usually at lunchtime and we would be, uh, ready for him. We knew it was all set up beforehand. So yeah, I'd be in the room with Spielberg and he'd be running on the chem and, and selecting dailies. Um, so I, I met him on, on many occasions. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that obviously one of the most influential directors of all time. Uh, I mean, it was just, you know, and, and again, I, I, the reason I bring that up is because of that. He is just, you know, one of the mo- most influential directors of all time. Uh, and you, know, you work with him afterwards on, on, uh, AI, which is a interesting project I wanted to ask about too. But, uh, oh. so, so what was some of the things you took away from working with Spielberg? Was there anything he told you, anything that maybe, you know, that, that he said that you just sort of like, Oh, you know, that's uh you know, you know, when you work with people at that level, it's sort of like, you know what I mean? It's you're, you're looking for something like an, a, 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 uh, almost like a quote or, or something that have that epiphany, that aha moment. Is there anything he sort of said to you that just sort of still sticks with you? Um, no, I mean, I, I don't really remember anything that uh, that he said. I mean, it was just an observation of, of somebody that can work, uh, that just has such amazing ideas uh, that can seemingly be manufactured out of nothing. Um, there's one particular story I, I talk about, um, and we were on Minority Report, and we had been editing for a while, and, and Spielberg was away, I think he was in Japan and he called into the editing room with a note of a, of a picture change to make. And it was not just straightforward. It was fairly complex. It involved three, four shots. And he said, I believe it will work better. Uh, and remember he's in a remote location. He's in Japan and we make the change on the chem. Um, and un- well, not unbelievably because he's Steven Spielberg, but the change worked exactly the way he said it would. And it just said to me that he had some kind of uh, video camera in his head that was able to actually run the footage back um, and then make editing changes in his own head. And I suppose from that point of view, I was thinking about um, you can... uh, Imagining the edit is is something that I try and do, and and that was something that he did, um, I, and I suppose that's something that I try and I try and utilize in my career today. Um, it's, that's uh, that's the best way I can answer that question. Oh, and, and sure, Michael. And uh, I wanted to just ask you know a follow up in, in, in editing as a whole. Are you ever given the script? you know, along with the footage or are you just given like the script, uh, script supervisor's notes, so to speak, when you're, when you're actually editing films? No, I have the, I have the, the, uh, line script, um, okay. each day, the, the line, the pages that were shot the day before come in and they're marked up from the script supervisor. And I work with the script, um, as I edit. Okay. I, I always, you know, like to hear how different people work. And, uh, you know, I've always wondered that because I know I was just reading about how some, sometimes, you know, scripts are uh, so carefully guarded. And, and you know what I mean? And it's just, 
sometimes the editor the editors you know they'll just get you know notes like that or and sometimes they'll actually be given the full script so they can actually just go you know read through it uh and i've worked with different line producers too who sometimes say look i i get the script i don't even read it dave because i just i just see different things like you know are pulled out of it and uh you know what i mean and they just go from there so um so when you're working with you know spielberg uh you worked with him again on on ai and i believe that that film was started by kubrick right and then it was finished by spielberg that's my understanding. Um, I, I wasn't really involved in in the Kubrick end of it. Um, I, I understand that Spielberg and Kubrick had had a conversation over a number of years about the making of AI, um, but I, I wasn't involved in the details of how that came about. I do remember that we had some footage that Kubrick had shot um, and it was footage of, of ocean waves and it was going to be used as an element in the, in the submerged Manhattan sequence. Uh, but as far as the, the, the transition of the director being Kubrick to Spielberg, I, I wasn't really involved in that. I, I see. And, and uh, cause I, I was just always fascinated because, you know, I heard so much about that movie and, uh, you know, that it was started by Kubrick and then it had to be finished by Spielberg and, uh, and everything else. And, you know, I actually saw it in a, in a film class I took in college and I actually liked it a lot more than other people did uh, because some people felt it would felt like two different movies coming together. Uh, right. When I always said I, that's probably what it was uh, because it was with Kubrick and, and, and Spielberg. But um and again, I just wanted to ask about that because, uh, uh, again, you know, you, that was a follow-up to Spielberg. So just sure. to sort of, you know, Turk, take this in, into, into uh, your, your career trajectory, you know, when you actually uh, went from an assistant editor to the actual editor, you know, uh, you've worked on some pretty cool projects. And I want to talk about, you know, just get how you became the editor. So at what sure. point did you realize that you were ready just to take on all the editing responsibilities and be, sort of be like that guy, so to speak? Uh, right. You know, when did you realize that you were, you were finally ready to do all that um i well it was in it was in 2004 when we finished the terminal um and uh, what what happened i mean you you touched on it a little bit earlier when you move countries you have to restart your career and that was definitely my experience um uh, as, as much as i was lucky to be picked up by peter Hones, it, it i had to spread out my you know find new contacts um so essentially uh, i did have to restart my career and even 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 when I went with in with uh, uh, Spielberg's editing crew, you know they didn't know me, um, and and I really had to sort of prove myself. So if I'd done you know eight years in England and I did another ten years, eight or ten years here, um, I really felt after that amount of time I was ready. I mean, usually if I'd stayed in England, maybe I would have made the jump sooner. Um, but because I really felt I had to restart my career in the United States, I I was I was ready probably sooner than um, 2004 at the end of the terminal is a a few things happened um, is that I moved up within the the ranks of that editing room. One of the assistants who'd been with um, Michael Kahn before me moved on to edit himself. So I was able to, to, to move up into a, into the first assistant uh, position. Um, And I felt that I did, uh, the terminal and Munich as as the first as as well, actually one of the first assistants. So at that point, I had gone as far as I was going to go in that editing room, and I felt again uh, maybe fatalist. I felt that I could do it, and again I just decided that was what I was going to do. But it, in in actual fact, it was it was I, I did finish the terminal. I went and cut a picture. And then I was out of work for a while and they offered me to come back on Munich, which I did. Um, and then I've been editing ever since then on my own. So when you went out on your own, you know, did you have a reel with you and, and say to, to, to different projects, you know, did you say, listen, I can, I, I am, you know, ready to, to be the editor now. Um, I mean, so, and also at that point, did you have like a lot of your own tools, uh, meaning that, you know, at your house, do you have like your own editing bay set up and, and, and you can work that way? I have done. Um, um, I sometimes have had, uh, and I cut on my laptop, which is, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you on my laptop right now. Um, I have, uh, uh, uh editing software on my laptop. I, I, I don't always like to do it because I like the separation between home and work. Um, but I do have some equipment uh, at home 
from time to time. But to go back to your your previous question, uh, uh, first part of your question, I, I cut a couple of short films. Um, and one of them I cut on film, and then one of them I cut on a laptop using um, software called FileMaker Pro. Um, and th that I use those movies as a calling card, um, and they help me get editing jobs. They certainly help me get my first feature-length movie, which was a picture called uh, My Bollywood Bride, or also known as My Faraway Bride. Um, but uh, I, I don't have an editing setup in my house, no. So uh, actually, that is a question I want to ask you too, Michael, is about actual editing. You know, when you're actually on a film set or you're actually in the editing lab, you know, working on this, you know, 99% of the films now are all digital. They're shot, you know, with, uh, you know, uh, probably one of, you know, 20 cameras. But you know what I mean? But like uh, versions of cameras, but they're all, you know, digital. You know, you're getting uh, either uh, different cards or you're getting hard drives, you're getting something. So what do you edit on now? Is there like a specific editing software like Advid, Premiere that you actually edit on? Yes, Avid, Avid Media Composer. Um, I've used, uh, as I say, I've used Final Cut Pro, but not for a long time. But I've used Premiere very minimally, although I'd like to use it more. But my main tool is Avid Media Composer. And, and why is, is Avid? I mean, because I've heard other people using Avid. Um, I'm, I'm like a Premiere guy. Um, mm -hmm. I actually just downloaded Avid's free. I don't know if you know this or not, but Avid just released a complete 100% legit free editing software called Avid Media Composer Free. And it's sort of like a light version of Media Composer, the pro grade version. And um, I'm just, you know, I get in there and play around a little bit. It's, it, I'm so used to, to Premiere that it's a little, there's obviously a learning curve. But, you know, what makes Avid like basically what, what most pro editors want to use? Well, that's a, that's a tough question. I don't, I mean, I use it because it's, it's always been the system that's been available. Um, I'm not sure that the, the tool, I mean, I've used, I've done the opposite to you. I've actually downloaded the free version of Premiere. So I've played around with Premiere in that sense. Um, but the, the, the most honest answer is that I use Avid Media, Media Composer because it's, it's what's been available to me and that's made me get used to it. Um, and that now that that's the reason I'm the most comfortable with the, with that system. Um, it's just that's the one that was presented to me. You know, when I was actually teaching editing courses at a, at a college, which is a whole nother story, by the way, Michael, how I got into that. Um, we, we had actually have a, we had a meeting because one professor wanted me to put in Vegas Studios. The mm -hmm. other professor wanted Avid Media Composer. The other professor wanted um, just Windows Movie Maker, and then I want a Premiere. So it's kind of uh -huh. like, well, how do you please everybody? Um, right. And so the answer was um, we ended up just going with Premiere, and Win Windows Movie Maker is free anyway. So And uh, I think somebody else wanted Final Cut, I think is what, what it was. So basically... You know, the the one professor came to me and she goes, oh, I, I've worked in, in different productions and this and that. And um, she she was getting info from other editors. She wasn't actually an editor. Actually, I was the only person that's ever actually edited a movie in the whole room, which was actually kind of funny. But everybody else just heard things like, oh, this is what this guy used and this is what that guy used. So she was on productions and she was like, well, I heard from my guy that they only use Advid and that's that. And that mm -hmm. you shouldn't be using anything else. And I always like to ask, because I always go back to that, because it was actually kind of funny how we're all in a room and we're all just sort of having a pissing contest about which editing software to use. Right. <laughs> so, it's, so it's good. To, I, I always, that's why I always ask that question. And uh, whenever uh, the students, when I actually would ever, whenever I would teach, they would go out into the field, most of them would find that people did still use Avid, uh, mm -hmm. and then. But I, I always said, you know, don't worry about an actual software. Worry about the principles of editing. Well, that's 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 absolutely correct, uh, and that's the reason I stick with with Avid. Um, although, say, I'm certainly not against um, trying out Premiere. It's just that I want to concentrate on the storytelling aspect of editing, uh, rather than the sort of how do you make a dissolve, which button do you push. Um, uh, there was a learning curve in the transition from editing on film to electronic editing for me. Um, and I spent, you know, a, a while getting used to working with the Avid. So once I was used to it, it's it, it sort of, it's, it's the devil, you know. Um, and, and as I say, just, I want to concentrate on the storytelling aspect rather than the actual software. 
Yeah, I, I completely agree 100%. Uh, it's all about the story and telling the best story possible. And, and I wanted to talk to you also just, you know, uh, about the hatred. Obviously, you know, it, I've been interviewing everybody uh, in the cast and crew of, the, of this movie. I actually talked to a, uh, a friend of yours, uh, Thomas Fleming. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and Thomas was like, oh, make sure you talk to Michael Trent. That guy's amazing. And uh, I, I was like, you know what? He's actually next on the list to, to, for me to talk to. So here we are. But I wanted to ask about the hatred and about, you know, editing, the, you know, editing that. So, you know, how did you go about, you know, getting the gig uh, on, on this movie? Uh, well, it was a situation where I, I was uh, I knew the director, um, the, the director and I met at elementary school, um, not to say that we met when we were um, eight, nine, 10, 11. Um, our sons went to the same elementary school here in Studio City. And uh, it, it, the, the, in in well, certainly the Studio City area, whenever you meet parents, there's, there's lots of people that are involved in the film industry. And uh, Mike and I were just talking, just standing around and, and you know, we ask each other what we did. Um, and, and that was a number of years ago. Um, so I met Mike through our sons at school um, and, and had talked for, for, well, probably a couple of years about filmmaking. Um, and then he asked me to edit the short film um, of The Hatred, which was called Hush. Uh, and then we had a certain amount of success with that. And he asked me to edit the feature after that. Um, so I didn't actually have to go out and get the job in this particular instance um, because I already knew the director. And uh, yeah, Mikey Kehoe, he's he's everywhere, right? I mean, uh, and by the way, do you know that the trailer for, for the film has over 10 million views? I did hear that. I got um, Mike. I didn't know it was as much as 10 million, but Mike uh, Kehoe called me the other day and said we were up to 7.4 million views. So that's just incredible that we're at 10 million views. Yeah, it's I, I actually saw it go over, I think, either on Friday night or last night, which is Saturday. I um I, I saw it roll over to 10 million and I was like, my God, this is, you know, this is like a juggernaut. So I wanted yeah. to ask, you know, Mike, did you did you edit the trailer as well? No, um, I, I edited a version of the trailer, um, but I believe the trailer was uh, made at uh, through Lionsgate I, and I. I believe that's correct, but no, no, I wasn't involved in editing of the trailer. Okay, I, I know sometimes the editors don't actually. There's a whole different trailer editor, and I just wanted to ask, you know. Uh, but yeah. still, you know, it, it's amazing that it's over 10 million views, and uh, you know, obviously, when when this comes out on September the 12th, you know, I'm actually you know interested to see you know how you know you know how how you know everyone responds, and uh, you know, I, because again, like Mike and I were saying. He wishes the movie was coming out, you know, this weekend because right. he's like, you know, all these things are happening. And he goes, now we have a we have a whole nother month or so before it's actually out. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, Mike, I wanted to ask you about editing the hatred. When you're actually editing a horror film like this, do you find that it, 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 there's a lot more of I mean, obviously, timing is everything. Right. So okay. is, is there more of a, of a timing when you're doing something like the hatred with horror rather than maybe something more like. I guess comedic, like like Gem and the Holograms, which you also edited. You know, I mean, obviously they're they're two very different films. So so obviously, is there a lot of like like what are some of the nuances that you have to sort of go through when you're editing two two different films, just like that, just as an example? Yeah, um, there's definitely a difference. Um, I mean, with a with a movie like um, uh, The Hatred, uh, especially, I mean, the, the opening of the movie. Well, the opening of the movie was. Uh, I, I edited with a certain amount of suspense. Um, when we introduced the girls, I, I edited, let's say, more of a normal movie. But when the uh, the the entity starts to take over the take over the uh, take over the house, um, but basically you edit to to put it simply to try and build tension and suspense. Um, the shots I just keep the shots longer um, and hold on things. Uh, a, a little bit more than I would certainly with a in an action movie or or with a with a comedy. Obviously, comedy is very much tied up with timing as well. Um, but if I was to put uh, uh, give you the broad strokes, is I generally hold the shots longer to try and build tension and suspense with a horror movie. 
So do you sometimes think that, you know, and, and when I, I was getting into editing, I made the mistake of cutting too much. Um, mm-hmm. And, and, and what, there was actually a professional editor who once told me, she, she said, Dave, when you cut too much like you're doing right now, it, 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 it gets a sense like there's a fight back and forth, like a power mm-hmm. struggle. And I, and mm-hmm. I, I started because when, when I, I was at, when what I was doing was I was cutting on the dialogue. So as soon mm-hmm. as you were done speaking, cut, go to the other person. And it was like, you know what I mean? Like it was it, and she goes, you see how that feels like a, almost like an argument. And I yeah. said, yeah, I, I get that now. I totally get that. And, yeah. you know, that, that's some of the things that I've picked up, too, over the years. That's why I imagine, you know, when you're, when you're doing horror, you, you have to hold on to those shots just a little bit more, hold on to those edits just a little bit more because you are trying to build that, that tension and suspense. That's, it. that's absolutely right. I mean, there was one particular instance in the, in the, in the hatred, and it's where uh, Alice walks across the room before she's about to go down into the, into the cellar. And uh, we started that shot and kept it long. It was just so she could do the whole walk across. She goes past a, a, a wall um, in the room. But we kept the, the, the whole length of the shot and also down the stairs. The whole piece was kept almost at full length. And it's for that exact reason. Uh, it was it, you know, just to build, to build that suspense. But definitely, I mean, another example I can, I can think of is – uh, this was in another movie, I think, but it was a similar kind of genre. But a shadow appears on the wall. And rather than cut when she w- walks through the door, you start on the where the shadow first appears on the wall and hold that shot all the way through to when the character walks through the door. Um, and again, it, with the, the hope and the aim of creating suspense. So, uh, you know, what, what are some of like the one, final things that you, you you hope just to talk about the hatred, just to sort of like come full circle? You know, what are some of the things that you you hope that people take away from the hatred after, after they got to, after a viewing of it, of the movie? Well, I hope they I hope they're scared, um, and I and I hope they talk about the movie afterwards. Um, if, if they if if we put the the audience on the edge of their seat, then I believe that we've done our jobs. Um, uh, as long as it's it, you know they. They enjoy the movie for those reasons, say, and get scared. Um, then, then, then I'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, you know, Mike, uh, j- just sort of to, to continuing to talk about editing. You know, what what are some of the tips or, or or principles that you've learned over the years? You know, that you would you could you know just sort of give the listeners who are maybe starting to edit their movies, or or maybe just to something that you know they could use if they're trying to edit their own movie. Um. It's a good question. Um, I think it probably goes largely goes back to what we were just talking about is that you want to, well, let's say, first of all, read the, read the script or read the scene and then decide what the emotion of the scene is. If the, the emotion of the scene is a fight, then you would edit just as you described, you know, c- cutting very quickly uh, on the dialogue lines or even on the dialogue. Um, to give the impression that one person is cutting the other person off. Um, if it's a romantic scene, again, you, you, you'd roll those shots out a little bit longer um, to, the, to create that, the, that romantic atmosphere. Um, uh, comedy probably speaks for itself. Is you've got to cut to the right reaction after the right amount of time after the punchline um, and hold on the punchline for the, the right amount of time. Uh, I think that these are the things that I've learned the most because I think that a lot of editors might have that tendency, as you just described, to cut too much. Um, the the other thing that you might uh, I often think about is is cutting to reaction shots and what is that person thinking? What is the opposing person thinking as that dialogue line is being spoken? And is it uh, is it relevant to cut to their reaction? Um, and I think it's all about generating the emotion that's intended by the writer, you know, that's written down. Um, so I, tr- I try and um, emulate what was originally imagined uh, by the writer. And, and you're always, you know, also you talking about reading the script and about, you know, finding the essence of that scene. You know, mm. what, what's this scene really about? You know, I've, you hear that a lot, too, in writing. And you realize just how closely involved editing and uh, uh, writing are because, you're, you know, you're trying to build that same atmosphere and now you're doing it with the actual footage while writers, you know, you're doing it and trying to get people to imagine this in their head, you know, trying to get like this little, this, these images and how everything would pan out in their head. So 
you know, when, when they're, they're very closely related and, you know, finding that core of the scene, you know, what's this scene really about? You know, maybe it's not really about a fight. Uh, that's just the after that's really the the sort of causation from the actual, you know, uh, I guess right. you want to say core of the scene, core of the problem, if you, if you will. Mm hmm. That's 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 correct. Um, I think that you do um, work very 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 much with the sort of the the writer's intention in mind, um, or at least my interpretation of what the writer's intention was, and I I edit with that in mind for sure. Yeah, and um, you know, that, and that's something too when when. Whenever you're editing anything, I, I think you have to ask yourself those questions. You know, you have to ask yourself those. You know, why are we even? Why is this scene even in here? You know, obviously, because uh, somebody once told me about it. About a, you could tell the difference between a good editor and a great editor uh, by how how um, how ruthless they'll cut stuff. And uh, there was this there was this one time a friend of mine was on was telling me that it took them two days to get this scene right. And the editor said to them, look, you got to cut it. And, the, and my friend said, who was the director, he goes, but it took us two days to shoot this stupid thing. And the editor yeah. said, uh, yeah, but it, has, it adds absolutely nothing to the movie. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that's, ex that that's, uh, that's absolutely right. I think that as an editor, you also have to look at the – you edit with the big picture in mind. Um, you you, uh, you maybe edit a character, but – then also edit that character with the whole story arc of the movie in mind. So if there's something that's going to pay off later and, uh, and um, there's a look maybe that you can hold on to, not to tele necessarily telegraph to the audience, but it could be something that, say, you hold on a shot earlier in the movie, which then pays off later. But I think that definitely you have to edit with the whole movie in mind. Yeah, very true. And that, and that also uh, that uh, includes that if a scene is not giving anything to the movie, even if it took two days to the shot, then you have to you have to cut the scene, um, and uh, and and be ruthless about it. Uh, if in the big picture, that's that's what's best for the movie. You know, I, I always watch deleted scenes off of some of my favorite movies on like Blu-ray or DVD, and and when I watch them, I can go, oh, you know what? Now I see why it's a deleted scene. Because literally, it, it added nothing to the movie. It added absolutely nothing. And yeah. uh, if you actually put it in there, it would have you know drug it down. Uh, yeah. Because you don't want people in, in the theaters be checking their watches, going, "Oh my god, when is this thing going to be over?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right, and that's that's you know that's the hope um, that we can judge um, what those scenes are and uh, and uh, uh, take them out for the good of the movie. Yeah, and, and, and very true. And uh, that, that's where you want to make sure the movie just sort of flows all together. And right. uh, I think that's what we're all going for, you know, even when we're writing a script or, you know, actually, you know, we're, we're all trying to just make sure that we're, A, servicing the film as a whole rather than anyone's, you know, ego, so to speak. And yep. two, uh, you know, always making sure that the movie is just flowing together um, and not too just too just disjointed if i could actually talk that would actually help <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> disjointed uh so michael we've been talking for about you know 35 minutes uh now so in just in parting is is there anything that you wanted to talk about that we didn't get a chance to or maybe just sort of any final thoughts to put a period at the end of this whole conversation um only that uh you know i've been i've been doing this this job for a, a number of years probably more than than i care to remember but it's it's a i i love the job um, to be, to be an editor is, is, uh, really for me, um, a, a satisfying profession. And, uh, as the, the cliche goes, if you enjoy what you do, then you never work a day in your life. Um, and, and that for me about editing is absolutely true. It, it's a, it's a passion of mine and something that I enjoy every day. Um, if, if that's something I can offer up as a, um, not that it's always easy. Um, there's periods of unemployment, um, but if you if you stick at it, then it's a very satisfying career. Yeah, and and that that's a, you know a good way to to sort of put it. Any a period at the end of this conversation is you have to do what you like. Uh, you have to do what you, you have to do what you love. Again, if I could talk, Michael, it'd actually be very helpful. Uh, but um, but yeah, you have to do what you love, and uh, you know that that's key to 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 life. You know. 
uh, I, I, you know, myself included, sometimes I've just done things or work jobs that you just hate. And you're like, what the hell am I doing to myself here? Uh, mm-hmm. So you have to, you have to really love this business to, 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 to make sure you're actually, you know, you want to do it. And there's a lot of tests in the way that actually make sure you're like, do you sure you want to do this? Uh, yeah. So, so uh, Michael, where can people find you at online? I'm sorry. What was that? Where, where can people find you at online? Um, well, I have a um, uh, my IMDb page. Um, um, I have a, a Vimeo um, uh, page also. Uh, really, just Michael Trent Film Editor. Uh, Google that, and a bunch of my stuff comes up. Um, my LinkedIn page, my IMDb page, the, the name of my agent. <laughs> and, uh, and my Vimeo page also come up, but yeah, Google Google my name and film editor, and uh, that's my online presence. And I will link to all of that, everyone, in the show notes at davebullis dot com. Twitter, it's at dave underscore bullis, and the podcast is at db podcast. Michael Trent, I want to say thank you so much for coming on, and uh, you know, I'm looking forward to the hatred. Great, and thank you for having me. Find Dave at davebullis dot com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.